again to Walking Down the Money Road. Having spoken to Jay Spearing and David Lee in the first two episodes of the podcast, which you can go back and watch on Facebook and YouTube, or listen over on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify, another time of course, our latest guest is a goalkeeper now in the twilight of his career. He made 62 appearances for Bolton Wanderers between 2012 and 2015, a period of time spanning three different managers and currently plays his football for Liverpool, with whom he has claimed a UEFA Super Cup and FIFA Club World Cup winner's medal and who knows, possibly even a Premier League winner's medal in the very near future. Our guest on episode three of Walking Down the Manny Road is Andy Lonergan. Hello Andy, how are you? Hello mate, yeah I'm good thank you, how are you? Very well thank you. Okay. So we'll start with the current situation. We're yeah. nearly two months into government lockdown now due to the COVID-19 pandemic. What have you been doing to keep yourself busy during this time? Uh, gardening. <laughs> um, loads of work in the garden really. Dig, dig in. I've been on, I've been on um, basically like a JCB type vehicle. Digging loads of concrete up, sledgehammers, jackhammers, everything mate. Everything. My back was knackered so I've had to chill out on that for a bit. Obviously, <laughs> Keeping fit as well and looking after the kids and what have you. But, you know, I've not been bored, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I think it's the time everyone's finding the jobs that they didn't know needed doing. Yeah, I know. So, yeah. Yeah. But it's, hard to it. get stuff, it's hard to get stuff in it, you know what I mean? We've got a room that we're supposed to be getting finished off, uh, carpet and what have you. You know what I mean? No, car- nothing, no one deliver. So it's, um, you know, some things that, we need doing on hold, but the garden took, took some doing. Like, right, let's bring it to football then. So, there's obvious uncertainty at the minute about the continuation of the Premier League and EFL promotion, relegation, everything in between still to be decided. But your current club, Liverpool, 25 points clear and a maximum of two wins away from a first league title in 30 years. Is there a genuine fear in the city that the trophy just isn't going to end up at Anfield? No, I don't think so. Obviously, the city, I can't really, you know, I don't live in the city. I, I've never really, you know, I go to training and I come home. Um, but with most of the lads, I don't think there's any doubt that, you know, we're not going to be champions. You know, that's that was the feeling I got the last time I saw them. It was about two months ago. But, um, no, I think, you know, whenever it's ready to go back, we will go back and hopefully we'll get the victories we need. We probably should have reworded that question as well. Is there a genuine fear in the city? Well, we all know it's a city of two colours, so yeah, yeah, yeah. the red half will yeah. be wanting that, the blue half probably don't want you to bring that trophy home. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> OK, so we'll come back to Liverpool later on, but for now let's focus on, obviously, what's brought people to this, and it's your time at Bolton. Yeah. You moved to the Reebok Stadium in the summer of 2012, joining a club that had just been relegated to the Championship and in need of more options in the goalkeeping department. That summer, we'd had the release of UC Askelainen, who went over to West Ham. Can you tell us how that move came about at the time? Yeah, it was... um, I was playing for Leeds, um, obviously, the season. So, Bolton got me from Leeds, but... The season before that, when I was at Preston, I think Burnley got promoted with Owen Coyle and Phil Hughes, who was the goalie coach. And I think they made sort of, I don't know if they made an official offer, but they, I think they were trying to sign us for Burnley. So I knew that Owen and Phil, well, mainly Phil, the goalkeeper coach, who was in charge of it, quite liked me. Um, and he was based in Leeds, so he got to a lot of the Leeds games. So around March, April of the season, I was at Leeds few people made contacts via agents and what have you and um, I heard there was a chance that Yussi was going and they wanted someone to come in and they, want, they wanted me and I was just it was like a, it was just unbelievable because Bolton I come to, used to come to quite a lot of Bolton games in the Prem I actually seen the first ever goal at a Reebok I went on a school trip and um, I can't remember who it was I think it was one apiece but we was at you know the first goal there and it was just one of them places where every time I'm driving on the M61, you just look at it and you're just like, what a class stadium, do you know what I mean? And I knew the doc, the club doc there, and he used to speak like so highly of the set up at Exton. And then when they come in, 
I was leaving Leeds and um, Neil Warnock was like, you can stay. We've got these, I think there were four teams. And he was talking them through. And as soon as he said Bolton, I said, that's it. Don't, don't even entertain the others. Just saw Bolton out. And then I think that was on the Friday and on the Monday I had a medical. So your decision to join Bolton, obviously you just mentioned, you didn't name any of the clubs and we won't ask you for those. But being a North West lad yourself, was that one of the big reasons for wanting to join Bolton at the time? Um, I guess it was because I sort of knew a lot about the club from being from the area, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, it definitely helped that it's only 15 minutes of training ground from where I live, but that wasn't that wasn't the reason at all, do you know what I mean? It was, it was good clubs, big clubs offering, but I just I also felt like with Adam Bogdan being a relatively young keeper and not having, I know he played really well, but not having many games, I thought it was a chance of potentially getting a few games there as well. Okay, so we'll come back to Bogdan in a few moments as well. Um, just for the record as well, you mentioned being present for the first goal at the Reebok. We did a lockdown quiz a couple of weeks ago and that was actually one of the questions for people to answer. The yeah. first goal at the Reebok was Alan Thompson and it was it's against Tottenham. Tottenham. It was against yeah. Tottenham. Yeah. We had, um, we had um, a science teacher, Mr T- Tidsley. Or T- yeah, Tidsley, and he was a big Bolton fan. And we had some German exchange students over and for some reason the school trip was to go to watch that game so we went and it was um, yeah it was class it was class and the Spurs goalkeeper that day was Ian Walker who also went on to have a spell at Bolton yeah. later in his career so yeah. bringing it back to yourself now so at the time of your arrival at Bolton Owen Kyle was the manager you've already mentioned was at Burnley the year before you played just once during Kyle's time at the club because he lost his job so soon after you arrived. That was in the October. Although it was relatively brief, what did you make of him in person and what very recently has been his well-documented training methods? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what's been said about his training methods. There's quite a few Bogdan. players come out and just said it was quite relaxed. Tactical work wasn't very big. And I know as a goalkeeper, you have your own separate coaches. Yeah. Sometimes you're away from the bigger group. But there's people have been quite complimentary about him as a man, but not exactly as um, preparation, shall we say. Yeah, well, firstly, as a man, he's a brilliant man. Really, like, I don't think anyone can speak bad of him. He's a top guy, real, like, infectious and energetic and... He put everything into it when I was there. I noticed that he never stopped. Training methods, it was fun. It was fun. We did shooting, five-a-sides. There was some tactical work, but then if you're winning games and you're doing five-a-sides, that's brilliant. If you're doing tactics and not winning games, the lads will say it's the worst training they've ever had. So, do you know what I mean? It's a bit of a, a, a catch-22, do you know what I mean? Like... You tell me a footballer that likes doing tactical work. Can't really name one. Everyone loves playing five sides and shooting and just enjoying themselves. Do you know what I mean? But he loved he, he loved it. He joined in and yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it, and I was I'm sad to see him go. To be honest, obviously for him as a person, it really hurt him. Do you know what I mean? And then obviously his backroom staff left as well, and they were good guys. Seem to recall at the time of Kyle being in charge as well, either a pre-season or some sort of behind closed door game where he put himself up front for half an hour as well. Did he? I don't think he did. I'll have to, have to go back and have a look at that one. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay, so yeah, moving maybe. on a little bit. Despite playing in four cup games in your first season, you had to wait until March before you made your league debut. That was a 1-0 win over Blackburn, which for those who maybe can't quite remember... That game was quite famous for Chris Eagles scoring in the final minute. Yeah. Dougie Friedman had been manager for five months at that time and it felt as though the opportunity had only presented itself because of injury to Adam Bogdan. So did you ever have any thoughts that it just wasn't going to happen for you at Bolton given you had to wait so long for your chance? No, not really because when Owen Coyle left, got the sack, I think 
was it Jimmy and Sammy Lee and Jimmy Phillips who were in charge. Yeah. And I got a real strong indication that I was going to play the next game. And I actually got injured in training. And I missed about four weeks. And then Dougie come in. And Adam was Adam's a good goalkeeper. I was really like, I, you know, I've not seen much of him. And um, when I got to work with him, I thought he is top, top keeper. So for me, it wasn't a problem. Adam was performing like to a high standard. What, you can't do anything if someone's doing that well. And I was one of, I've always been one of them. If he's doing well, the team are doing well. Success comes with that. You get promotion. If we've got promotion and Adam would have played 50 games, cup games, whatever, who cares? We've gone up. Do you know what I mean? But I think, um, I don't even know. I think he'd done his groin or something. But from that moment on, it was one of them where it was like, I think we played 50% of the games each because he he kept getting injured, which wasn't ideal for him. You know what I mean? He'd have setback after setback. But I thought he was a fantastic keeper. I really did. We've seen things at the time of him being at the club and obviously since he's moved on at the same club as you know, Liverpool and Hibernian. He's always come across as a little bit of a confidence player. So when things were going well, the shot stopping ability that he had was as good as anything in the Premier League when he first came in. But then we also had a few bad games. Obviously, you've mentioned the injuries. And I think that's shown on his day. He got the move to Liverpool. But on his bad days, as we've seen since, he's started to work his way back down that football pyramid a little bit. So, yeah. moving into your yeah. Yeah. moving into your second season, apologies for interrupting you there. Right. Uh, Bogdan regained his place at the start of that second season, but injury put him on the sidelines, as you mentioned. And that gave you your first extended run in the team. So things were going quite well until heavy defeats at Leicester and Reading. They were 5-3 and 7-1, respectively. So you come in for a little bit of unjust criticism. Bogdan was brought back around February time. Did this affect your confidence and morale at all after having, after having so long in the team? Um, it probably did, but obviously letting in that amount of goals, you know what I mean? I remember the Reading game. I look back and I'm like, there's not really anything I could have done. The goals they were like, one was a 2v1 and, you know, 1v1s and stuff like that. And it wasn't like seven howlers, but you let in seven goals and you got to expect it. And I knew Dougie was, Dougie was a massive fan of Bogdan. And I knew if we were both fit, he's going to play Bogdan. But, you know, I was happy at the club. I really enjoyed it. And there was never a time where, not once, where I thought, I, need, I want to leave Bolton because I'm not playing. Do you know what I mean? Because, um, but, you know, that's how it is. You, every club, there's only one keeper that can play. And if you're not performing to a standard, you're not going to play. So, you know, that's just that's one of them things. So, you mentioned there if you're not playing to a certain standard, you expect to lose your place. Obviously, there was injuries to Bogdan and yourself during those times. Which one would you rather have? If you had a choice, obviously... You have goalkeepers, not usually like any other position where players get um, moved around due to number of games yeah. or racking up five, ten yellow cards. Would you rather be in that position where you've got that security or does having somebody hot on your heels, maybe playing 50-60% of games, sometimes bring out the best in you? Which of the um, two would you rather have? I'd probably rather know I was going to play all the time. So I think you can sort of chill out a bit. Not chill out, but you still work hard. But I had at Preston where I played. I think I played nearly 150 games in a row. And I had, I wouldn't say no competition. There was young lads on the bench. But, you know, I never got injured. I never missed a day of training. And you just, you get, the more you play, the more you sort of, if you have 20 good games, then one bad game, that bad game really just gets pushed under the carpet. But if you're coming in for two or three and you have one good one, one average one and one bad one, you start thinking, shit, do you know what I mean? So it's difficult, but um, obviously the higher up you go, the more competition there's going to be and you've got to embrace it really. Yeah, because you want the knowledge that you're number one goalkeeper, or at least in the manager's plans, but obviously if you've got that in the back of your mind that one mistake can amount, out, it's not good for anyone's confidence no, or morale, is it? No, I think... Um, you know, but that could be the same with, with any situation. There's not many goalkeepers that will get away with making more than one mistake these days because there's two or three at every club that are 
you know, not far off each other. So it's it's part of being a keeper, mate. Not that it's not ideal, like, but you know, I chose to do it. So. Okay, so 2014-15, your third and ultimately your final season at Bolton. Another injury to Adam Bogdan at the start of that campaign finally give you a chance to nail down a regular starting role in the team. But the goalpost shifted again in the October when Dougie Friedman lost his job. Your statistics under Friedman, I had a look a little bit earlier on today, very strange. 38 appearances, 53 times an unused substitute. A number of players recently were mentioned Owen Coyle earlier, but a number of players have spoken of difficult or distant relationships with Dougie Friedman. But how did you find him? Yeah, he was he was a very different personality to Coyle and to Lennon. Um, he were quite reserved. Um, you didn't really know where you stood with him, to be honest. He, he always felt a little bit, you know... Um, yeah, you weren't sure. I don't think anyone was. And he, he, was, he was sound as well, Dougie. Um, he did a few things towards the end that I thought, you know, was a bit bit strange. But, um, you know, Dougie was more of a tactical manager. You know, we spend a lot of time doing tactics rather than playing football. So it was different. Um, but no, it was all right, Dougie. It was all right. Are you a little bit surprised that he's not managed to find himself another job as a manager or...? Looking, really. at the, got, looking at the role he's moved into at Palace, do you think that's his future direction? Um, I don't know. I mean, it seems, looking from the outside, it seems a lot more of a secure job than being a manager. I mean, when you're a manager, you, you can't really, you know, the life the lifespan of a manager is is ridiculous now. And you know, a certain, a certain sorry, in for example, the Championship, they probably get six months. That's the average time a manager stays. I'm guessing. So, you know, if someone like Dougie's got his family settled and he gets a manager's job and it doesn't work out and six months later they're moving again, you know, so I'm guessing he's, he's happy. He's, he's a Palace, bit of a Palace guy, isn't he? And, um, you know, fair play to him. Obviously, going to the lifespan of managers, I think when Phil Parkinson had finished his first year at Bolton, I remember looking at the statistics and he was halfway up that table already in yeah. terms of duration of that job. Yeah, and um, by the time he came to the end after three years or so, I think there was only two or three in League One at the time that had done further. And one of those, had, I think, was Gareth Ainsworth, who managed about yeah. ten years. Right. So a little yeah, bit like the Premier League after Fergie and Wenger went. Well, yeah, you you lose two or three games, and everyone's calling for your head. So it's it's a tough it's a tough job, and I wouldn't um, yeah I don't envy anyone who's got a manager's job. Okay, so Neil Lennon was next through the door. Move on from Dougie Friedman. So Neil Lennon was next through the door and you kept your place for a good few months. And this was until a 4-1 defeat at Nottingham Forest in February 2015, effectively ended your season. For people who don't remember that particular game, you suffered a concussion in that match and you picked that up in conceding a penalty. Naturally, there's some folk who think amateur dramatics came into, into play, which we know isn't correct. But tell us from your point of view what happened that day and speak us through those final few months at the club where once you got over that concussion, you effectively appeared as though you'd been frozen out. Yeah, no, it wasn't, um, it wasn't really like that. I mean, Lennon come in and was like a proper old school manager. He would hammer people if they weren't doing well. But if you were doing well, he was brilliant, if you know what I mean. And I felt like I played some, some, some good stuff under him. We had... You know, we had a good, um, a pretty decent run, to be honest. I remember his first game, we beat Birmingham away 1-0. And then we went through, I think, December, and we kept four clean sheets in a row and, and stuff like that. We did really well. But then I think, you know, the Liverpool game, when we got beat at home um, in the FA Cup, I think things sort of changed after that because we played with 10 men for, what, 30 minutes against the top team. We had Millsy up front. If you remember, he's a centre-half. He played up front for 90 minutes. And, um, you know, we come in the dressing room thinking we've, we've given it our all, but the reaction that he gave sort of killed a few players, do you know what I mean? But, um, yeah, he weren't happy. <laughs> um, but then the Nottingham Forest game, I actually, I don't remember anything of the game. 
I don't remember anything. I remember waking up, sort of being, looking back now, it took me a while to get over that. I was out for about a month with a concussion. I just couldn't shift it. Um, I never had concussion before. And I just thought it's just a bit of a, you got a bit dizzy, but I was, I was clean out, absolutely clean out. I don't remember anything apart from waking up at the hospital in a neck brace. And then I went back to sleep and the next morning I woke up and I had a kit on, minus my shin pads and my boots what he took off. And then the physio was there. I'm like, what's happened? <laughs> and then he told me and then I watched it back. And I think Moxie saw me a bit short of a back pass, a header. And I've come to pick it up. And Dexter Blackstock, I think it is, his, his um, shoulders hit my head. And from that, that was it. That was it, mate. So there was no dramatics there, mate. I didn't know, I didn't know what it, day it was for about 24 hours. So, yeah. And naturally, you're the one that gets the foul given against you for getting knocked out. So that's football for I, you. I think, it, I, I think it just, when I watch it back, I don't even know if I had it. He just ran. Because I was going down and he, he must have gone in and I just hit his shoulder. And if he's running full white, he's just absolutely flattened me. Flattened me. And then obviously Ben Amos come and done really well. So me and, me and Shaggy were both like, well, we're both out of contract. So we, no one knew what was happening. Well, that leads us perfectly on to the next question, really. So Adam Bogdan moved on to Liverpool that summer. Ben Amos, who had been on loan, had quite a good loan spell with respect to him as well, turned his move from Manchester United into a permanent deal. Although, reportedly, that was on quite a lucrative contract. It was quite clear, looking at it, that Lennon really didn't see you as his first choice in the long term. So, how did you take that at the time, especially knowing that with two goalkeepers, one of them including yourself, being out of contract, that could have been your chance to really cement that number one place. No, I don't think I don't think it was that because I played quite a lot of games for him and we were talking about a new contract. And I was changing agents at the time, which held it up. And I'd have signed one in the January, I think I was going to sign one. But I changed agents and I, obviously I couldn't sign it because of the contract issues. And then when I got injured, I never played. But he never gave me the impression that he didn't want me to stay. Um, but then towards the end of it, I remember him saying they're really financially in trouble and they can get me and Adam's wages off and bring someone else in. So we were both surprised when they took Ben on reportedly what he's earning because you know, I don't think any of us were earning anywhere near that at the time. So it was a bit of a strange one because the club, I think, Pratt stayed, I think, didn't he? But Millsy, Craig, myself, Adam... There's quite a few that left, all under the impression that the money had run out and they couldn't afford to keep anyone. Well, obviously, with Ben Amos's, again, reported contracts being quite lucrative at the time, and four-year deal, which we only managed to get off the books this time last year. You've just mentioned there that there were a couple of little warning signs that things just weren't quite right financially. Was there anything before your contract talks, and we're talking sort of January to the summer of 2015 here, were there any sort of warning signs before then that anyone picked up on, or do you think all the dirty um, laundry has just come out since? No, I don't think there, there was. Obviously, when I was, what they offered me was less than I was signed on, but it didn't really bother me, to be honest. I was happy to stay, do you know what I mean? I thought it don't, it don't really matter, but then... I think Pratt's, I was talking to Pratt's and he was telling me how much did slash his wages and he was wanting to stay and a bit further down the line, um, weeks had the same problem, <clears throat> where like dramatically they reduced it. But lads wanted to stay, they weren't really concerned about the money. Do you know what I mean? What, what people got in the past, no one's going to say no to that. But you know, a lot of the lads, they loved the club and they wanted to, they'd re-sign for... 60, 70, 80% less than they were getting. Do you know what I mean? And I was one of them, I'd have done that. That's great to hear as well. We've spoken to Jay Spearing a few weeks ago and he said he loved the club. It was money was never the issue. Ultimately, he left a couple of years after you. His reasonings for that were the owners at the time who the Andersons 
fortunately for yourself, you never got to experience. But we'll bring it back to the actual field now. Let's talk about contracts and money. But looking at these stats again, we've already mentioned this, but rather than just picking out one season, we'll go as your entire time at Bolton. So it's difficult to summarise, really. After a 20-year period of consistency with Keith Brannigan and then UC Eskalainen, a number of different managers just couldn't seem to commit to a regular goalkeeper. So 62 appearances for yourself, a further 73 times sat on the bench as an unused sub. How would you sum up your own individual time at Bolton? Um, I loved it. I loved it at Bolton, me. I loved it. Great lads, especially the training ground was brilliant. It's a shame they've had to get rid of that. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, I loved it, mate. Really liked it. Enjoyed playing. Enjoyed playing at the well, it's not a Reebok anymore, but do you know what I mean? The stadium was brilliant. The fans were quality. I loved it. Obviously, I liked to play every game, but you know, that's, that's life. And obviously, you say it's not the Reebok anymore, but to all those Bolton fans, it always will be. Yeah, yeah, I still call it a Reebok anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even call it the Macron as well. I was like, no, it's the Reebok. But no, it was really good. There's some good people there. And I went, um, when did I go back? Last season, maybe. I went back to a game and um, I was speaking to, the, I think it was the doc. And, you know, these guys were working unpaid. There's people behind the scenes that are they haven't been paid since this was probably March time. And was it last season? When, it was last season, wasn't it? In the champ when Middlesbrough. Yeah. When we I was at Middlesbrough and we, we played Bolton and I was speaking to them all and they're like, we've not been paid since September. I'm thinking. But that's how like the people were there. They, they just got on with it and do you know what I mean? It was it was tough to see, but they're all really good people. Yeah, and I can say that firsthand as well. Without not going to name any names because that wouldn't be fair of me. But going back to, I think it was last August, maybe even July. I'll have to look at the dates for the specifics. But in a courtroom with Lawrence Bassini trying to claim ownership of the club, some club employees in that very courtroom that day, wondering not not really whether they will have money coming in or whether they'll have jobs to go back to, but whether the club would even survive. Yeah. So again, yeah. not going to name names specifically, because that isn't fair of me at all. But yeah. they are the real people, the everyday staff are the people that keep these football clubs running. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so we'll move on to your time at Liverpool. Now, we started with Liverpool at the beginning, but we'll go back to that now. So since leaving Bolton, you've been at Fulham. Wolves, Leeds, Middlesbrough and ended last season on loan at Rochdale. So in your Keith, words... With Keith Hill. With Keith Hill as well, yeah. <laughs> so in your own words, because nobody else really saw it come in, how did you end up training and ultimately signing for Liverpool? Um, well, basically at the, end, at the end of the season, there's quite, um, quite a lot of the Premier League clubs are looking at English players especially as number three goalkeepers to it basically allows the promising young lads to go low. Um, so that's what it was. There was quite a few Premier League clubs that were like making contacts and what have you. And um, then Liverpool, I think, wanted to send Camille Grabara to Huddersfield. Oh, well, they didn't say Huddersfield, but they wanted to send him on loan, a young Polish goalkeeper. And that left them short for pre-season because Alisson was still with Brazil. So, um, they made contact and said, do you want to come to America, train with us, and um, we'll take it from there. So I went and managed to play a game. Um, tough training, really tough. Um, and then come back, Alison was fit. One of the young keepers was doing really well. And, um, and then I thought that was that. And then Alison got injured the first game of the season and I think I signed the day after. So it was... You know, pretty lucky, really. Well, lucky for me, not for him. <laughs> yeah, so it's a little bit of an unexpected bonus, really, that having <laughs> played for the clubs in the levels that you have, you get to this stage of your career and you're training with the very best. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I did a podcast before and I was saying about it, like I had the opportunity when I was younger to go to like 
well, what would have been a Champions League club at the time when I was about 21, but that was all agreed for the end of the season. And um, I missed two years with injury in that period. So obviously I never got the opportunity. And there was times at Preston when I could have moved to the Premier League and bids got rejected when I was certain they'd be accepted. So, you know, I got there in the end. Well, good things come to those who wait, as the old saying goes. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> you haven't actually played a competitive game for Liverpool yet. Who's to say that's not going to arrive soon? Nobody will be able to take away the medals that you've won this season. So you can even call yourself a world champion. Yeah, well, do you know what I mean, mate? I was on the bench for the World Cup, on the bench in the Super Cup. You know, it's only, like, I'm saying to people, the, the state I'm at, the best goalkeeper in the world is the goalkeeper for this team. So, flipping heck. Do you know what I mean? Then you've got Adrian, who's, I think, will be in the Spanish squad soon. So there's a lot of class keepers, and it's not all about the one at well. It is, but you know, there's a group of us that work hard every day to make sure the guy who's playing's you know on top form. So it's like so it's a team within a team. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so I already mentioned training with the very best, but the quality of this current Liverpool team is just incredible to watch. But as someone who's actually lived it day in day out up until a couple of months ago. Talk us through how it compares to everywhere else you've experienced in your career. You've mentioned the training's tough. That's to be expected given a team at the very top of the Premier League and current European champions as well. But talk us through what is it like to just see some of these players at the moment. Yeah, it's um, the best squad, apart from obviously this season, the best squad I when I came in was at Bolton when they come down from the Prem, the likes of Petrov and all these guys. I thought this standard is... It was unreal. Right? I was certain that that team would walk the championship, having been in the championship all my career. I've never seen a better squad. Obviously, it didn't work out, but then I've been around and I've come here and it's just the difference between a championship player and these guys. Sort of, not just, not everyone's talented, not just the talent, but the work they put in. Do you know what I mean? You wouldn't think like, if you went in the gym before training, the, the first you know, the first people you see, obviously James Milner's known for it. You get Milner, Lalana, Mane and Salah, always. They're the best players in the world and they never stop. <clears throat> so there's things like that that, you know, people don't see. Don't see how hard they actually work. They only see what happens on a Saturday. But the work they do is, is 24-7, mate. They never stop. If any of them are looking for a little bit of match fitness when we get started again we'll happily take one or two of them on loan <laughs> you just mentioned there just bring it back to Bolton very briefly you just mentioned aside from the current Liverpool team the Bolton team the first year after relegation from the Premier League was as good as anything you've seen in your career we came really close to getting into the playoffs that season we missed out on the final day what was the mood like at the time given Everything that's happened since, obviously, we've come nowhere near reaching the playoffs or the Premier League. What was the mood like at the time, having come so close? Um, I remember it being... It, we sort of went on a pretty good run towards the end because we were miles off it. So, credit to Dougie for that. Went on a really good run. and um, <clears throat> yeah, I think we had Blackpool at home. And I remember driving to training that week and was listening to Talk Sport and they were saying... Bolton's the tip. Bolton will get promoted through the playoffs to sneak in. And, and I, don't, I just don't know what happened. I remember being, I think, were we 2 0 down? Yeah, we were 2 0 down yeah. after about 20 minutes. Got it back to 2 0 yeah. at half time, and that's how it finished. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a funny one because like, it, was, it was a game we really should have won. Do you know what I mean? I, think, I, I, just, I just can't explain what really happened. I mean, it, I think he, Rob Hall made his debut and he brought him off yeah. after 35 minutes. And it's just things like that. I think it was just a real strange set up for that occasion but um, you know I, I really think if we'd have got in the playoffs we'd have been the form team and we'd have, they'd have gone back up yeah you quite often see that a team comes from nowhere to get some gets themselves promoted yeah it was only February time that season I think we were a point or a goal difference just keeping us out of the bottom three so it just yeah. shows just how good that yeah. run was in those final couple yeah. of months I think as well the teams that normally make a late run they are not necessarily got the quality that Bolton had. I think we were in a false position. I think we should have been a lot higher. So it would have been like, 
you know, dark horses, but really would have been, I think would have been favourites in them playoffs with the players we have. Yeah, it's almost as if at the time it wasn't seen as a thing, but we've obviously seen it in the eight, seven or eight years or so since Bolton, but the number of clubs that drop out of the Premier League and it takes them a long time to adapt. In some cases, yeah. they don't adapt at all. We saw yeah. Wolves go down two years in a row. I think Wigan went down two in a row or two in three seasons. Ourselves went down two in four years. It's yeah. it never really used it. to happen, yeah. did it? But it does more and more. No, if you, because there's, there's so many teams that have come down. That championship such a competitive league. I think if you don't go up the first season when you've come down, I think you're going to really struggle. And the team, teams are seeing that now. I think this year, if Fulham, Fulham don't go up, they might be in a spot of bother, obviously, because they've still got the big earners and what have you. But we'll see. Yeah, I think you look at the bottom of the championship at the moment. Huddersfield have had a bad season. Stoke, yeah, they've both come down last year. Yeah, them two, yeah. Blum and I forgot about them, yeah. Middlesbrough, yeah. another big name, struggling. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the longer you don't go up, obviously, look at them. Bolton, how, how, it, how it's come. Do you know what I mean? I, I can see there being a few more like that if they carry on paying the wages they're paying. Yeah, it's really is sad to, to see. Yeah. So, bring it back to you now. 36 years old, presumably out of contracts in the summer. You've mentioned right at the top of the show you don't envy anybody that takes on a manager's role. But what's next for you? Are you looking to continue playing either at Liverpool or elsewhere or maybe you're looking at going into coaching or stepping away from the game when that time is right yeah I don't, I don't know mate I'm not going to pack in anytime soon because I've not missed a day's training in probably three or four years I train every day I'm fit do you know what I mean I can still you know still still get about the goal um, no I'll, I'll carry on playing as long as I feel I'm I'm capable and I'm enjoying it. The day I stop enjoying it, I'll, I'll pack in and who knows, mate. I've got an, I've got a few things outside of football that I've got interest in, but I think I like to be a coach. I mean, we've had discussions. Jay Spearing's going to be a manager. Me and Wheat are going in this his back room. <laughs> I don't know if he wants that, but me and Wheat said we'll do it. Um, yeah, I don't know. You never know, mate. I'd like to be a goalkeeper coach, I think. Yeah, I'd love to be a goalkeeper coach. Okay, so... Possibly a case of watch this space and see what happens in the future. But 36 years yeah. old is nothing for a goalkeeper. So I wish you every success with carrying on, yeah. either at your current club or wherever it is. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. So what we're going to do in the next step, we've done this with a couple of other players. We want your own views on this. It's just a little quick fire Q&A. And your answers can only be about Bolton. Right. Okay, so... First of all, there's three to choose from. I think one of them, because you only played one game, we're going to be ruling him out here. But best manager? I'll say Lennon. I'll say Neil Lennon. He's a good manager. Real good manager. Okay, is there any particular reason for that? Obviously, we saw when times were good, it was really good. But then on the yeah, flip side, it was well, really bad when the times got going. Yeah, well, I can't say Coyle because I only played one game. Yeah. But I really like Coyle. And then it was toss up between Dougie and, and Lennon. And, but I just, I like Lennon's style of giving a bollocking rather than not saying anything. Do you know what I mean? At least yeah. you knew where you stood. Um, and obviously, he's a good manager because look at, you know, his success with Celtic. Did it come as a little bit of a surprise that things didn't go so well for him at Bolton or do you think with off-field events he's got yeah case to defend himself there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're only as good as your players and, you know, be honest, some of the, you know, once, once the transfer budget's cut and what have you and you can, you know, you can only work with what you've got. I mean, he's shown at Celtic that, you know, he's got good players but what he does there is is brilliant because Rangers are just as good. I I think you know what I mean, player for player and that. But no, yeah, he's a good manager, Len. Good manager. Just seems to be the perfect fit for him up at Celtic, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've discussed best manager. We're going with Neil Lennon. Best player. Best player. Um, I would probably say. Alonso was good, never played much. Alonso was technically very good. Um, best player, I was a big fan of Tim Ream. 
big fan of Tim Ream. Um, I recommended him to Fulham as well when I went down there and he signed him. So, um, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, um, Tim, I'd probably say for his consistency, Tim. Yeah, yeah he's two time, I think, successive seasons, player of the season as well. Two million pound in memory recalls we got yeah. from Fulham at the time and again, well publicised, Bolton's financial problems of the time and still to this day, £2 million not to be sniffed at when that chance comes along. So, yeah, yeah. spoken about your best manager, your best player, what about your best opponent? Was there ever a striker that you came up against and just thinking, I'm in for a difficult afternoon here? Was there ever anybody that seemed to score past you every time they played? Um, there's no one I don't think he scored past me when I was at Bolton but Jordan Rhodes was a difficult one because he wouldn't do it I mean he scored in the, like the 95th minute against us I weren't playing I think it might have been I think it might have been Amos um, at Ewood Park and he doesn't touch the ball in 90 minutes and then he pops up and he, he taps it in um, he was always difficult um, trying to think who else A couple of the direct teams, he always had the big fellas up front. They're difficult to play against because if you're unless the ball coming into the box, but off the top of me, I'd probably say Jordan. Jordan Rhodes was a difficult one because the, the defenders especially thought he's he's done nothing. Do you know what I mean? I've got him in my pocket, and then all of a sudden you turn around, he's knocked it in one nil. So yeah, probably Jordan Rhodes. Yeah, he's got a fair few goals against Bolton, and definitely agree with that. A number of times we thought we've had a good afternoon, room for a point, yeah. maybe even all three. 93rd yeah. minute, up pops Jordan Rhodes. Yeah, yeah, dangerous, dangerous in the box. Another striker who, I'm going to mention the 7 1 at Reading again. Oh, another Alfie. striker who bagged was Adam Lafondre. Yeah. Thoughts yeah, on Alfie. him? Good player, mate. Really good player. Yeah, really impressed with him. He's had a great career. He was a um, top player. I forgot about Alfie. Yeah, really good player. A name very fondly thought of by Bolton fans as well due to his time at the club. Yeah, brilliant. Last one for the moment with the quick fire Q and A, which hasn't been that quick. Um, yeah. Favorite memory of your time at Bolton? Just the lads, just meeting the lads in dressing room. Davy Weeter, like one of my best mates. Jay, Craig Davis, you know people like that. Just characters, absolute characters, mate. Brilliant guys. Was there any particular game that stands out? Obviously, going from playoffs to then, what really in your following two years was just a mid-table team. Is there anything that really stands out from that time? Um, the game situation, let me think. I enjoyed my debut at um, the home, the Blackburn one in the derby, do you know what I mean? Um, that was one, but you know, it was that long ago, mate. I can't really remember specific games, you know what I mean? I think... Um, Neil Lennon's first game against Birmingham away. Personally, I really enjoyed that. The one 0 victory, you know, that was a a real big, a real big win for us to get off on that start. And I think probably bottom of the league at the time. Do you know what I mean? To get us to get us on track to not get relegated. Okay, so we'll finish on a similar note, but this time with Liverpool. We've spoken about the quality at the club, but if you had to pick one, who would be the best player at the moment at Liverpool? Impossible to pick. It's impossible. You've got the best goalie in the world, the best defender, best midfielders, and the best striker. It's impossible to pick, mate. They're all just frightening. Um, my favourite player to watch is probably, I'd probably say, either Sadio or Firmino. I'm not saying that just, just to watch, you know, the way Sadio just goes past people and gets kicked every single game and he just gets up and gets on with it and it's like he's made out of rubber and then you've got Firmino who just makes it look easy but then again you can say that about Alisson and Van Dijk it just, it just looks easy for him This makes you wonder a little bit how it took these guys a while to get to the top or how they went on notice like Van Dijk obviously playing on the continent moving to Celtic to Southampton before Liverpool and Sadio Mane, another one that was at Southampton. It does make you question. Yeah. No, but I think, you know, it's not as if they've gone to, you know, they've gone to Premier League. I think maybe 
teams teams are looking at like the bigger clubs are looking at players saying we'll see how they get on in the Premier League before we take the gamble and if they can do it in the Prem then they buy them and the, the transfer fee is not really an issue are they for the big clubs so um, yeah well none of them have probably played a lot of league anyway have they <laughs> you know what I mean they've all been top level and I think that really shows in the Liverpool team at the minute you've obviously got a few genuine world class players who have been at the top for a number of years but it's full of the first team especially it's full of players that have worked their way to the top we've just mentioned Van Dijk we've mentioned Sadio Mane captain Jordan Henderson I think he came through at Sunderland had time at Coventry another one yeah he's been there the best part of a decade now but people that have genuinely had to work hard to get to where they are today yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, everyone that's there has had to work hard. Everyone that's a footballer has had to work hard, to be honest. But, you know, people like Jordan Henderson, just until you watch him play, I, th- I think like the English the English press, you don't realise how good he is because obviously he, he likes a Salah and these guys get the credit because they're the match winners, aren't they? You know what I mean? They're the, the sort of skillful you know, they catch the eye, but the work the likes of Hendo and Genie one older than these guys do is, is vital. You know what I mean? Okay, so it's pretty much all we've got time for. But before we do go, have you got a message for the Bolton fans that are either watching or listening to this? Just keep supporting your team, regardless of what's happening behind the scenes. That You know, it's, it's sad, it's disappointing, you know, the attendance. My next one there was a season ticket holder and you know, when I speak to him, it's just like, it is, I, I, I feel for him. Do you know what I mean? But I think just whatever happens this season, next season, just keep supporting them and get behind the team and hopefully it'll give give everyone a lift and whatever happens behind the scenes, just you can't control it. So, but you can support the team and I'm sure it'll give the best for you. Okay, so a big thank you to Andy Lonergan, of Andy Lonergan even for being our guest on episode three of Walking Down the Manny Road. Whether you're watching on Burned and Aces, our social media channels on Facebook or YouTube, or taking in the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts or Spotify, be sure to like, share and subscribe to be informed of future episodes as and when they drop. Previous episodes with Jay Spearing and David Lee are also available to stream on demand. But for now, thank you for joining us. He's been Andy Lonergan. I've been Chris Mann. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.